Thank you all for being here for this event today. I am Tamara Sharinian, a postdoctoral teaching fellow in sociology and anthropology, and the co-director of women's and gender studies here at Millsaps College. Today's talk is not only a part of the Friday Forum series, but is also the keynote lecture for the 2019 Millsaps College Feminist Studies Colloquium. Before we get to our wonderful speaker this afternoon, Dr. Ebony Lumumba, I want to introduce the colloquium, uh, as well as acknowledge many of the people who are a part of pulling this together. This is the second annual Feminist Studies Colloquium here at Millsaps College. The colloquium is a space that promotes active participation in and interventions into feminist thought. After the lecture this afternoon, I invite you all to stay and take part in the reception that will be right out here on the second floor of this building, as well as the pop-up exhibition of visual art that is also out there, research workshop seminars, presentation of creative works, and a roundtable discussion on the future of women and feminism within the academy, all of which will involve students and faculty from Millsaps College Tougaloo College and Jackson State University and focus on feminist thought. Programs for uh, details with all of these events are available um, up there if you still don't have one. The Feminist Studies Colloquium this year would not have been possible without the work of, in various capacities, Maria Langford, Kenneth Townsend, Lauren Ferguson, <coughs> Suzette Jennings, um, and the planning committee, Ann McMaster, Liz Egan, Luanda Evans, Jennifer Luton Yates, Shelley Poe, and Sue Carey Drummond. And of course, this event would not have been possible if it was not for the excitement and engagement of our students who submitted their work and who are here today to actively participate in the formation of new thought. Now for the very honorable task of introducing our speaker. Dr. Ebony Lumumba is currently an assistant professor of English at Tuvalu College, where she teaches courses in global and American literatures and serves as department chair. She received her PhD in English literature from the University of Mississippi, her master's of arts in English from Georgia State University, and graduated magna cum laude from Spelman College with a Bachelor of Arts in English. She was named the 2013 Eudora Welty Research Fellow by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History and the Eudora Welty Foundation, and was honored as Tougaloo College's Humanities Teacher of the Year in 2014. She specializes in post-colonial literatures in the Global South and representational equity in film culture in her, in her research, academic publications, and instruction. Dr. Lumumba is an active scholar with publications such as a chapter in From Uncle Tom's Cabin to the Help, Critical Perspectives in White Authored Texts of Black Life. Caught in the act of living, wealthy as a lawyer and witness of black life. The Matter of Black Lives in American Literature, Eudora Welty's Nonfiction and Photography, in teaching the works of Eudora Welty, 21st Century Approaches, and a chapter in the forthcoming collection, New Essays on Welty, Class, and Race, titled Demonstration of Life, Signifying for Social Justice in Eudora Welty's The Demonstrators. Dr. Lumumba is also an avid supporter of education and the arts. Her zeal for both are evinced in her participation in various community projects, she currently serves as a board member for the Foundation for Mississippi History, the Mississippi Humanities Council, the International Ballet Competition, and the Mississippi Book Festival, and participates in, on the national advisory boards of the Eudora Welty Foundation and the Mississippi Museum of Art. She is also the founder of Mothers Obtaining Justice and Opportunities, also known as Mojo, a nonprofit organization that supports mothers pursuing undergraduate and graduate degrees. In her spare time, she also serves as the host of Right On Mississippi. I can't believe you have spare time. <laughs> a literary podcast sponsored by the Mississippi Book Festival. 
Dr. Lumumba is happily married to her kindergarten sweetheart, Chokwe Antar Lumumba, Honorable Mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, and the couple has two unbelievably adorable daughters, Alake and Nubia. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Ebony Lumumba. Thank you, thank you, Tamar, and thank you, Millsap, to everyone else in the audience. I don't think there's anything more uh, intimidating than coming behind your own bios <laughs> that you wrote yourself. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm, I was thrilled to be asked by um, Dr. Sheridan, we're on first name basis, uh, to grace this forum because there are rare moments where we get to have honest dialogues about the intersections of our identities as women. There are far too few places to do that. So thank you all for planning this. Thank you for your time and your effort uh, for putting together such a necessary event. When I thought, when I was asked and I thought about uh, accepting and what I would talk about, I thought about all of these sessions and meetings and demonstrations that I've been to over the past several years where uh, we're discussing women and our rights and things that have been denied us uh, in legislature. And those are all really exciting events and they've all been fruitful, but I found that oftentimes they've existed as simply these powerful pep rallies, right? Where we pat each other on the back because we get it and we're getting it right. And we leave excited, but we don't leave with an agenda for action. And so I think that it's important that we're here today, and this is just sort of the, the kickoff for an afternoon of really exciting uh, discussion and, and research and engagement, but I want to challenge us to do one thing that is vital in any discussion about formations of freedom, and that is to indict ourselves. Look at where we've gone wrong, uh, perhaps as feminists or womanists or allies. So I'm going to kick off with a bit of a confession uh, that for a long while I was not a feminist. And that wasn't because I didn't believe that women deserved movements and motivations that advocated for our political and social, economic, and cultural autonomy. It was because as a serious student of history and literature, I began to realize the ways that feminism had failed black women. And so I couldn't sincerely align myself with a movement that didn't center my experience and my identity. If we're honest with ourselves, which I hope we will be today, we'll admit that the ways that feminism has failed black women are staggering and painful. Black feminists confront what's called a dualism in our fight for a feminine autonomy, the first of which contends with this contempt within African and African American communities for feminism. You see, feminism has not always been welcome in the fight for black liberation. The second aspect of that dualism is that black feminists must contend with the difference between white or Western feminism and black feminism. The issues focused upon with the first and second waves of feminism, such as suffrage and property rights, equality in the workplace, ignore the social realities and the debased social position of black women who, at the time of those movements, needed access to much more basic rights. But then I was introduced to black women writers like Alice Walker. And while I couldn't at that moment align myself with the feminists in my history books, I began to, what began to resonate with, with me was how Alice Walker responded to the dualism and reimagined the form formation of feminism for black women. And so what she did was coin a term called womanism. How many people have heard this term? Very good. This movement was described as one with deep roots in racial and gender-based oppression for black women, very simply defined as a feminist of color. And it was characterized as being outrageous and audacious and courageous and willful, deliberate. And that stuck with me. That was me as a little girl and me as a woman. And so this imaging or imagining of feminism as womanism resisted what I saw as the erasure of black women that transpired in a movement that claimed to support all women. 
And so, I am a womanist. The erasure of black women that I argue has become increasingly aggressive as it relates to the world of tech and science fiction has deep historicity. Black female activists as early as the 1800s found that their abolition work was wrought with the weight of also having to advocate specifically for the liberation of black women and the roles assigned to them by society. So in 1830, Maria Stewart indicted, quote, both white and black men who discriminated against or refused to advocate or aid African American women whose talents and too often their sexual virtue were buried and performed servile labor. Black women in America were isolated, even in the struggle against enslavement, according to Stewart. So black women's usefulness has historically been bound to utility that supports other demographics. It has been the expectation that black women who are shunned for any desire to think of themselves in the struggle for social freedom best serve the larger community by nurturing it. As long as the constructed image of black female identities has served or supported white ideals, she has been allowed to exist, granted representation. Otherwise, the black woman is wholly overlooked and erased. And I want to note that this goes beyond marginalization. That's a term that we often use to describe black female experience. But you see, margins are still quite visible. They're necessary so that we recognize what's at the center. They hold the center in. We have to know that they are there. Black women are marginalized and pushed to the margins when we comply with the stereotypical social standards of black female identity. We are erased when we do not. When we think of archetypes that were forged uh, in the mid to late 19th and early 20th centuries, that of Mammy, Jezebel, Sapphire. We must note that these are mythologies that were crafted in ways that juxtapose a similar, similarly constructed, uh, accepted image of white female identity. So what you're looking at are images, of course, of Mammy there. And I chose this image of Mammy because it demonstrates the commodification of the black female form, identity, and body. I didn't want to choose, when you Google Mammy images, it brings up Hattie McDaniels, a real woman who simply played Mammy as a character. And so I couldn't show her face in good conscience because it would directly align her whole humanity and identity to a mythology, which is Mammy. And for anyone who may be unfamiliar, we understand that Mammy, this constructed image was presented as a non-sexual, uh, often enslaved, overweight black woman who served white families and enjoyed this um, air of benevolence because of her proximity to the white family. So that's what made Mammy good, because she worked in the house. She was close to the family. They entrusted her with uh, their children. Incidentally, when we see representations of Mammy, we rarely, if ever, see her with her own family, her own children. Jezebel is an image that I don't think we talk as much about as Mammy, but we need to understand that Jezebel has some very dangerous implications for understanding black female identities. See, she's the antithesis to the Victoria lady, right? And this image demonstrates her overt sexuality. And in that, she's also linked to uh, this notion that black women cannot be rape victims because they are wanton and they want these sexual acts. They have a hunger and a thirst and a desire for it. Now, she is derived from uh, misrepresentations and misunderstanding of the first encounters with African people and African cultures where, one, they're living in uh, terribly hot climates, and so they're not wearing as many clothing as the Westerners who were encountering those lands. And so at first, that's immediately correlated to uh, sexual proclivities. Also, the, uh, there were cultural dances and movements that were seen as suggestive by the outside looking in, which they were, we know that uh, those of us who have studied African dance, they have meaning that demonstrate fertility and growth and life and power. But to an uneducated observer, it simply looks like gyrating and mindless dancing. And so Jezebel comes out of that thought, and also the practice of polygamy in some African communities was misconstrued as this uh, need for uh, these 
overwhelming sexual experiences, which any one with an understanding of uh, polygamous environments understands that it has absolutely nothing to do with the sex, right? So Jezebel, her figure comes out of those misunderstandings, but she has persisted. Sapphire, probably the least known or the least named of these African-American female archetypes, these created characters, these mythologies, uh, she has some of the most dangerous implications. She is characterized as overbearing, domineering, with a masculine build or masculine capabilities, so much so that she overpowers and emasculates the black man. So while that doesn't sound harmless, the connection that's made is even more tragic. Because she emasculates the black man, then she is, the, she is to blame for fatherless families. She is to blame for unemployment because she's taken the black man's job. That is how this character has been constructed. So these powerfully damning characters to craft these deleterious standards for black women in turn characterizes white women as wholesome, pure, righteous, worth being seen and saved. Now I wanna note that that wholly oppresses white women as well, right? Because it's shrouding them in this patriarchal image of pure, sanctimonious white womanhood that's pristine and pedestal worthy. And if you can imagine in your mind a pedestal, there's not much that you can do in the, in the way of serve or work or produce when you're standing above everyone else. You're simply there to be seen. So again, we must understand that these archetypes, as they're juxtaposed to uh, the ideal image of the white woman, oppress, oppresses white women as well. It, it places them with this illusion of power and placement and simultaneously disempowers them. So it's no secret that the projection of the sanctity of white womanhood, right, also a myth, has existed across American history as just cause for violent aggression against black bodies, and that was typically, or mainly, black males. So historical narratives have ignored the ways that black women have suffered from being the embodiment of the antithesis of ideal womanhood. This suffering manifests in a number of realms, but today I'm most interested in the ways black women have gradually uh, been discarded from social consideration and the implications that that has for the future. So we find ourselves at a femi feminist colloquium today, and perhaps we might consider the predecessors of an event like this. What comes to mind for me is uh, the 1851 Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio, where Sojourner Truth gave her iconic Ain't I a Woman speech. Truth's oration paints a vivid picture of the debased social position of black women in America with historical relevance. Truth constructs a sophisticated indictment, although not being able to read or write, of the social dynamic that seemingly privileges and protects white women while disappearing the existence and needs of black women altogether. In that speech, for those of you who are familiar, Truth says that that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best places everywhere. Now considering, it's 1851, the unjust reality of chattel slavery at the time, we're under we understand that the women that Truth is speaking of in that quotation are what? She goes on to add, nobody ever helps me into carriages over mud puddles or gives me any best place. Ain't I a woman? Forcing into focus the vast inequities that exist for black women even among an audience claiming to be concerned with all women's rights. Along, among those supposed allies and some of the first to carry the mantle of feminism that day in Akron, Ohio, Truth reminds the crowd that there is an entire faction of femaleness that has been ignored and erased. And so the entirety of her oration there talks about her capabilities as a formerly enslaved woman to plow a field and to uh, be very powerful in terms of agricultural work and to do more than she's ever seen any man done. And in doing that, I believe that truth uh, sort of negates these unjust characterizations that we saw on the previous slide of Mammy and Sapphire 
and Jezebel. What she does in her speech is not only indict the audience verbally, but causes them to indict themselves by saying, what you see here is not what you've come to expect or accept about black women, and ain't I a woman. By sharing the reality of her lived experience, truth resists being discarded as a stereotype or tangible support for the liberation movement of other women. The erasure of black women from spaces that claim to possess deep concern for the rights of women persisted. Evidence of this was present in the manner in which black women and their issues were purposely ignored by those spearheading efforts of the movement for women to gain voting rights. Historian Paula Giddings explains that black women who dedicated themselves to the work of suffrage were shunned by black men who were fearful of the social implications of empowering women and alienated by white women who were reluctant to advocate suffrage for black women because of white supremacists within their ranks. Now as a result of this type of social isolation, black female activists formed their own organizations such as uh, the Tuskegee Women's Club or the Alpha Suffrage Club to host their own demonstrations that championed their cause and also resisted reductive and, and um, restricting stereotypes held by dominant culture about black women. Despite the burgeoning numbers of black women at the time who were pursuing education and working in non-domestic positions, it was acknowledged that suffrage for black women would serve to drastically increase these numbers in a fashion that would allow black women to move beyond the bondage of domesticity. The struggle for suffrage in black women's circles was more than a fight for voting rights. It strived to shed inequitable characterizations projected onto black women at the time. So Alpha Suffrage Club founder Ida B. Wells resisted this traditionally accepted role for black women in her formation of the Alpha Suffrage Club. And she registered the club in the 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade organized by the then all-white National American Women's Suffrage Association. At the time, Wells was, Wells was told that they could march, but they were not able to march with the white women. And they would need to march at the rear of the line. And the sort of comedic irony there is Alpha Suffrage Club should have been at the front, <laughs> alphabetically. And they were uh, organized alphabetically. So in spite of threats and discouragement, well, the Alpha Suffrage Club and many other fe black female organizations participated in this parade. And they were uh, pummeled with objects thrown at them by the crowd, a crowd that supported white women's suffrage but did not want to see black women in that realm. Bertha Campbell, a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority who also participated in the march, that group noted that she heard jeers from white men in the crowd screaming, go back to the kitchen. And they were talking to the black women and linking the embodiment of black female identity to the pervasive image of Mammy, who spends most of her time in the kitchen. Wells, and any students of Ida B. Wells, uh, she was a short woman in stature, but uh, verbose, fiery, and tall in terms of courage, but uh, she defied the directives of the NAWSA and joined the white female Chicago delegation in her right alphabetical role. So imagine, you know, five foot nothing, Ida B. Wells with her banner, walking in the midst of a parade of white women where she wasn't supposed to be and demanding that she gets to march in her rightful alphabetical space. That's what she did. She refused to serve as the marginalia that allowed white womanhood to be neatly packaged and centered. And she resisted erasure. I want to mention a contemporary moment that brought this march back to my memory, a march that I've been studying since college. But at the most recent State of the Union address, we saw uh, Democratic women dressed in all white. And they were commemorating this parade. And it was a bittersweet moment for me because although I'm sure that it was well-intentioned, what they were commemorating was historically inaccurate. They were, of, they were of mixed race and cultural background in their seats at the State of the Union in their white, and they look stunning, but that's a misrepresentation of history because we understand that women of color and women of diverse social, back, social and cultural backgrounds would not have been allowed to intermingle with the white women. And this parade, although it may strive for 
a larger women's movement demonstrated the long road that black women had to traverse in order to be seen, even if people went up to protest for more rights. So I think that's an interesting moment, that the way that um, contemporary occurrences continue to erase the black woman's experience. Black women's experience at that parade wasn't jovial. It wasn't safe. And it wasn't a sort of kumbaya universal sisterhood moment. So as we swing forward, let's swing forward into the present with that mention and consider the way mass media is overwrought with commercials that feature jovial and often overweight black women who embody the ideal of mammy as they peddle cleaning products and fried chicken. Television shows and music videos and films with overwhelmingly with this overwhelming presence of black women who are hypersexualized or violently combated. These are the vestiges of the manner in which images of black women have been controlled and altered, and they are alarmingly prominent in our present world. Palpable proof that Mammy, Jezebel, and Sapphire live on. And as long as black women embody roles that mimic these problematic archetypes, they actually escape erasure, right? They don't mind. Society doesn't mind it's being seen in volumes within the confines of those three archetypal roles. It is once there is movement outside of that stifling room that black women face utter annihilation, which brings us to the future as seen through the technology industry, science fiction as it relates to uh, literature and film. If we pay keen attention to the world of tech and sci-fi, which we can't get away from it. Most people are uh, on their cell phones right now, either checking an email, a text message, a social media site, maybe taking a picture, doing homework, whatever. <laughs> we can't deny the massive lack of black female representation in those realms. Considering the aspirations of Silicon Valley and Hollywood's preoccupation with sci-fi, proposing to paint this picture of a future world, the absence of, this is substantial absence of black women, I should say, presents this complete annihilation of black women in the future. Sci-fi films and novels rarely, if ever, feature black female leads. And right now, you're probably in your head making a list of the ones that you can remember. However many you can list, it's not enough. In many of these narratives, the black female character is alone in her identity intersection. She is the last of her kind, right? And so we can't be fooled by thinking equity looks like the placement of one or two pieces, right? A sprinkling of, of pepper, if you will. I want to draw your attention to Whoopi Goldberg's character here, Guinan from Star Trek Next Generation. And what's most remarkable about that role is that Whoopi Goldberg, the, at the time, millionaire, had to entreat producers to create that role for her. There was no woman of color, black woman, on the next generation of Star Trek. Now, she was inspired by Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura there at the top. In the earliest iterations of the Star Trek saga, fantasy. And so she felt a connection there that at least there was one. So maybe there should be one more. But again, I want to point our attention to that this is still, this still doesn't look, this is not what representation looks like. This is not what equity looks like. One or two who get to survive. And there are often still uh, aspects of Mammy Jezebel, you've seen some of Uhura's outfits, <laughs> and Sapphire in these roles. In some instances, when we do have black female representations in sci-fi, they have unearthed virulent racial opposition. I want to draw your attention to uh, copies of these tweets. How many fans of the Hunger Games do we have? Okay. So when the first Hunger Games film was released, 
there's a character named Rue, and in the film, Amanda Steinberg, a biracial who, a young woman who identifies as black, played the role. And my husband and I, y'all, if y'all tell him, I'll kill you. <laughs> we sobbed when Rue dies. Imagine my shock and awe when I realized that many other people didn't feel that same sort of emotion for a black female body. These tweets are evidence. One tweet reads that awkward moment when Rue is some black girl and not the blonde, innocent girl you picture. And as a word person, I just, the proximity to blonde and, blonde and innocent mm -hmm. is resounding, right? And it's almost interchangeable. Mm -hmm. The next tweet is far more vicious. It says, call me racist, but I can that, that lead in. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me racist. <laughs> But when I found out Rue was black, her death wasn't as sad. Which communicates a very specific message. That black female bodies are disposable. Black female lives do not have any value. And I didn't have to search very far for these tweets because there are dozens more. Some, one that reads, uh, who does Rue why does Rue have to be black? Not gonna lie, kind of ruined the movie. Why is Rue black? Sigh. I reread the bit where Rue and Katniss are talking, but imagine Rue being white and it seemed better. Man. Like that's genetically impossible. I wanna put a dude behind that. Like that's genetically impossible, dude. <laughs> Rue can't be black in the movie. No, it can't be. There's devastation going on in the Twitterverse because this innocent character who was pure, who was uh, valuable, who incited a riot at her death was imaged as black. The most astounding tweet is here at the bottom. Since when has Rue been a nigga? Which, thank you for that clear and effective communication, <laughs> right? Because we understand that that term, the N-word, is synonymous with waste and lack and uselessness. And so that person is communicating exactly what the black female form means to them. And there are many more tweets. Interestingly, uh, whoever put together this montage, I can't take credit for it, but put Susan Collins' original words about the, words about the root character in the text. She has dark brown skin and eyes. In the book. <laughs> but look at the readiness that society has to completely erasing that line from the novel and only tapping into the fact that Rue is an innocent character, she must be white and blonde. So listen, if y'all are not natural blonde, <laughs> what does that say about you? And apparently innocence is not believable in a black body. The tech industry possesses similar biases. Black women represent a disappointing 4% of the workforce and leadership of major companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, companies that we are using at this very moment. I think I Googled this image. That number is steadily declining, which is alarming because when and if black women have found roles in these corporations, there has been workplace hostility or a lack of support for advancement that has forced them into other careers and other businesses. That number declines also because it's not accurately reported. So if we look at this stat here, this is a breakdown, but this is rare. It breaks down by ethnicity. So we see, and this is an old uh, statistic uh, from uh, almost two years ago, 2017. And so it's dropped at least 0.8%, and it's steadily declining. Right now, we're at about 4% for those major companies. It's reported that there are fewer black women in tech today than there were eight years ago, again, being sort of forced out. These companies often have diversity initiatives and dedicate personnel to creating diverse workforces. However, those efforts have rarely, if ever, yielded the presence of more black women in tech. Now, the defense across the board has been that there just don't exist black women who have the expertise or the credentials 
to do the work that will contribute to the future of our world. I'd argue that black women who are developers, programmers, analysts, etc., fail to meet the expected narrative of who black women must be to support a hegemonic society, and thus are deleted from consideration. Take, for example, Stephanie Lampkin, who was told when she applied for a job at Google that she was not technical enough for a lead analyst role. And so what I want to do here is take a moment to let you hear Stephanie communicate that for herself. I always tell people my first image of a computer scientist was not a white guy in hoodie and flip flops. It was someone who looked like me. And so I went on and became a full stack developer, APCS, Stanford, MIT, applied for a job at Google in a little lead role, and they told me I wasn't technical enough. That they would keep my resume on hand in case a more sales or marketing position opens up. And I found out at the time, with 55,000 employees, they only had 12 African American women in technical roles. And telling the media, it's a pipeline problem. We just, we can't find qualified women and people of color. And so I took my non technical self and built the first version of the app. So what Stephanie is sharing there is alarming, right? Despite having degrees from Stanford and MIT, she wasn't technical enough, and they keep her on file for a sales position or a marketing position, something to support the company's gain in that capacity. I want to point to one of the things that Stephanie mentions first, which is what she saw when she was first inspired to pursue a career in tech. And it was the image of a developer who looked like her. That was her inspiration. And so we've been talking about images here, but I want to underscore the power of images for benevolent use, right? Literary theorist Carolyn Gerald speaks to the power of connecting uh, these created images through myths and image making, especially as it relates to racial imaging. Ger Gerald asserts that our realities are linked to these mythical images. Whether or not those who produce those images possess any sort of authority on the subject. So the images of Mammy and Jezebel and Sapphire do not represent the complex and nuanced re reality of black women. However, their pervasiveness has cemented their association with the black female experience. Gerald suggests that all created images, especially those within literary art re that reinforce racial bias, represent a certain point of view that emphasizes certain features of reality while blocking out some and completely ignoring the rest. In Gerald's estimation, these images leave us with a reality that is not objective, but rather a reshaping of reality. The danger in this manipulation is that it allows for the most dominant voices of society to control narratives that house an amalgam of cultures and identities and realities. The perspective becomes one-sided and valid portrayals and truths are totally disregarded. Whole communities are erased. And the purveyors of these images come to exist as unworthy authorities and an entire cultural demographic becomes housed within one person's sphere of influence and we can be led to believe whatever he wishes us to. Thus, a dangerous monolithic narrative is generated and perpetuated. This has been the case with the long accepted and widely promoted images of black women as useful in only roles of service, sex, or scandal. But I have often said that it is the writers who will save us a romantic that way. And that's precisely what black female Afrofuturistic and speculative writers such as Octavia Butler, Tanana Redu, and why it's more are doing with works that privilege black women and place us in the future. By writing worlds where the actual survival of future communities relies on the leadership of black women, these writers not only guarantee their existence, but allow for everyone else's existence to depend on black women. Imagine that. Resisting this subtextual erasure 
by fields that predict our impending human existence. Octavia Butler's uh, Parable of the Sower is a great example of this claim. Here we go. And it expertly represents the dynamic that I discussed. This text is set in the 2020s, which for us is next year. <laughs> <laughs> Never fear, Butler wrote this in 1993, which the 2020 did seem a long ways away back then. But it follows the experience of Lauren, Lauren Oya Olamina, a teenager with hyper empathy who ultimately outlives her entire family and leads other survivors in establishing a new existence as an earth seed community. It's Lauren's deep sense of awareness and spiritual awakening that guides and salvages those who do not succumb to the chaos of a greed ridden, poverty stricken, apocalyptic world. And I would also assert in Parable of the Sower that the reason that the world is turned out this way. Butler doesn't allow that to be placed on black women. But Lauren, as a young black woman, is a key in saving the community that continues to exist. Butler's characterization of this young black girl as the savior and seer of what's left in the future resists generations of negative imaging of the black female experience. Butler herself is a black female writer during the late 20th century in the realm of science fiction totally resists. Her successful writing career in canon of speculative and fantasy fiction proved that black women would not only be present and necessary in the future, but that she, as a black woman, had contributions for the present world that countered limited projections. Butler undoubtedly inaugurated a galaxy of possibilities for other black women in the realm of science fiction. Liberian American author Wyatt T. Moore is of the new vanguard of black female speculative writers who I believe benefit from Butler. Moore credits Butler, among other writers, with influencing her work and paving the way by saying, for a storytelling style that doesn't marginalize our talents, our crafts, that doesn't put us in boxes, that allows us to explore literature and the written word in ways that are culturally true, her 2018 debut novel, She Would Be King, revises the history of Liberia through three characters, Gebessa, Jude, and Norman Aragon. While all three characters possess powerful supernatural capabilities, it's the lone female, Gebessa, who would be king were she not a woman. This complicated dynamic of gender oppression hindering Gebessa from taking the formal social position as leader in Liberia simultaneously nods to her enhanced capacity to lead her community. Moore not only privileges black female experiences in the characterization of Gabessa, she also does so by characterizing the wind as a spirit of an enslaved woman named Charlotte who possesses infinite wisdom. Moore shares that the spirit of the wind character was deeply inspired by her own grandmother and asserts that her quote, ubiquity pays homage or homage to the black female identity. Moore has openly shared that she experienced difficulty in securing a publisher for her African speculative no novel until Black Panther proved to be such a good. <laughs> so she was shopping this incredible book around and no one believed that people would want to read about a speculative or fantasy African society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Oscars proved differently this year. This, I believe, substantiates my claim that the vital role of the vital role that imaging plays in the gradual attempt to erase black women. Seeing the success of another futuristic narrative that privileges black women's presence both in front of and behind the camera led to publishers pressing reset, control, alt, delete, if you will, right? On Moore's imagining of a futuristic world with a black population. And in the center, those images are of the black women who were behind the scenes. So there on the left-hand side, you have Ruth Carter, who is the costume designer. On the left, 
you have Hannah Beachler, who was the production designer, the first woman that Marvel allowed to design the production of a futuristic world. First woman, not first woman of color, first woman. Uh, I believe more links the recent popularity of African-based narratives that merge the supernatural and science to black writers returning to this very culturally authentic method of storytelling. So what Moore says is this sort of speculative or fantasy storytelling is inherent in African identity. This is where it started for her. And she talks about her grandmother and her mother and her, and her aunt telling her stories that were supernatural or seeing ghosts and that sort of thing. So it was nothing new to her very black, very African identity. Butler, Moore, and others produce texts that resist and reset the historic erasure of black women by presenting narratives that not only place black female characters at the center of the action on a futuristic earth, but also allow that action to rely on their very existence. They effectively transgress the racist and sexist social structures plaguing black women, specifically within the world of tech, sci-fi, and fantasy. And interestingly, uh, in a recent interview with Hannah Beachler, there on the right hand side, she says that the motivation for her to create Wakanda, which she in essence does that, uh, is because she believes black people belong in space and black people belong in the future. And what we see when we have an entire culture of science fiction and technology that doesn't have an overwhelming presence of black people, specifically black women for the purposes of this talk, is that we won't be there. So there are no preparations made for us. Hannah Beachler, Beachler uh, disagrees. In her essay, Salvation is the Issue, black female writer Toni K. Bambara com conveys her belief that the stories that are told about, the black, about black people, rather, possess the power to either eliminate or preserve life. She maintains that stories are important. They keep us alive. So with their deeply rooted, audacious narratives, the black sci-fi and speculative female writers I've mentioned, albeit briefly, today resist the erasure of black women now and in the future. They keep us alive. Thank you. Which takes a, which will take a long time, lots of note taking. But that's why I would start. 
and the agenda I think will form out of that. Yes, sir. I think another part of that agenda is to make men, especially black men, aware that when we're looking at women, a lot of times we look at women as mates and, and, and you know the equals, as opposed to looking at them as our daughters and our granddaughters. Because when I look at this and I put my daughters and my granddaughters in my mind, I can see them. It's not a backwards and forwards a fight between me and a, a woman and all that sort of thing. And if we can just emphasize to me that your daughters and your mothers, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just this equal battle of who's equal, who's more, and all that. It's bringing up children so that my daughter and my granddaughter would not live this miserable life of uh, suffering just because you belong. I think to your point, thank you for your comment. I think to your point, what I hear you queuing in on is this, this familial intimacy that we should have as human beings with one another. And uh, also impressing upon men that this also in some way oppresses or stifles you. Yeah. If women are to play one role, then you're forced into the opposite role. Yeah. And so uh, one of my favorite Nigerian authors, Chimamanda Adichie, tells a very comical story about growing up and being a little girl uh, in her classroom and the teacher leaving the room for a moment and putting one student in charge. And so she is, uh, like my four-year-old and like I was at that age, she wants to be in charge as the woman, but the teacher wants a male student to be in charge. And so she puts this young boy in charge who doesn't have any aspirations for that sort of leadership. And I think the, the student leader gets a stick or something. I don't know if they were supposed to hit people with it, but Chimamanda wants the stick. The little boy doesn't, but it's forced into his hand. So you can imagine what that does to men and boys who are forced into these social positions that don't jive with their uh, very personal yeah. internal characteristics and you know affinities. Yes, yes sir. to communicate that there isn't power in any role that you occupy. Um, there is power in being a cook. There is power in being a nanny to children and being a mother, all of these sort of traditional female roles. It's all about uh, your perspective in the way that you occupy the role. And so I think that if we start to reimagine the purpose of those roles, what's interesting is that uh, women are relegated to these roles that are supposed to seemingly be less then, but they are roles that preserve humanity. Feeding people and taking care of children. We'd all die if we didn't eat and there were no more children. The human race would be annihilated. So I think there, there has to be a reimagining of every role on every level and seeing the value, the true value that all of those bring to the way that we need to exist as a, as a human race, as humanity. Yes, sir. I'm happy to say that the largest growing demographic that we have in Millsaps is black women. Black. I am much less happy to say that it's clear to us that we don't know yet how to really support their success. And I hear lots of comments about them feeling not only marginalized, but invisible. Mm -hmm. And I just want some tangible ways that we can change that situation for the young women that we've been able to attract but been less able to support. I think, I've honestly, I honestly think you've taken the first step in acknowledging that there is an issue. And I am a huge fan of putting people in the position to respond to their own issues. So that may mean elevating some of these young 
black female student leaders or young black female students to leadership positions so that they can start to imagine for themselves what the solutions are to the issues that they experience. They know better than any of us, right? I, I teach young black female students every day, but there is a disparity between what my experience is and what theirs is. So I can't sit in a meeting and respond to my colleagues and say, this is what they need. I don't, I don't know. And so I think we need to empower people to use their experiences to help to shape the world into what it needs to be for their success. And the ways that we do that, I think, are very myriad. But empowering folks to be self-determined, to generate the solution to their own issues, I think that is something that's a mental paradigm shift in American society because you know, we live in a society where we want leadership to solve problems, whether that's municipal leadership, national leadership, uh, institutional leadership. But we possess a lot of the elements that we need to resolve the things that directly affect us. So I think empowering some of those young people to come up with solutions and then allow them to initiate them and to integrate them into the culture here would be an outstanding step. Thank you for that thought. Yes. Uh, I have a question that's kind of like two parts to it, but before I get to it, just kind of like help out with what you said, you know, black students, ethnic college, uh, I think like another thing that would help out people is actually like listening to what the black females around here have to say and being able to communicate with all of them because like you said, we possess a lot of things within us already that help us solve our own issues, but when you don't have enough black representation, black female representation here on a college campus, then you're not always able to come, um, you're not always able to get those solutions that you need because you are always want to talk about a white male or a white female. So if either they don't understand where we're coming from or they don't know what we need because they don't understand our experiences and what we're going through today, because they need to think that all black females here are the same. Mm -hmm. When it's like, you can't just follow the law one. But I think that it helps from like getting them all together and being able to help each other. Like, we empower each other every day because like, we're our own little community. We're our own little community together because we got to stand with each other because we don't have enough representation on campus. But thank you for what you're saying. Thank you for what you just said. Oh, thank you. But uh, my question for you was how do we, as um, black women, as women, like, how do we express our, how, how do we express our dominance to men? How do we, do we express how we can be a better asset to them and to the world, period, without threatening their existence? Or, is there, or will there always be a threat to a man existing when they don't understand what they're all <laughs> <laughs> Or when they're so used to the role, like you said, they don't want the role, yeah. like they're given their role, so they're just only comfortable with it. So how do we, like, express that to them without threatening them? I don't think that's your job. I don't think it's your job to change someone else's idea of who you are and what you contribute. And so there's a whole lot of work in feminism to be done by men who either contributed to the issues that we face or benefit from them in a way that we, it's not our prerogative to dismantle. And so you, are, you do have vital contributions to the societies and the communities that you inhabit. That's what you're doing. And if that's threatening to anyone, male, female, or what have you, then it's not your prerogative to change how your contribution makes them feel slighted in some way. I don't think that you have the power to do that as a human being. Now, we are talking about speculative, so if you have some superpowers, <laughs> it's all good. But I wouldn't waste my time trying to convince someone that I am not threatening. I might be. <laughs> Depends on what you're scared of. Mm -hmm. We have time for one, one more question. question. Mm -hmm. I saw a hand, this young lady here. Um, can you give our three line question to my fellow Sure. Tech. Let's see what we're all about. It. <laughs> Can you read the last part of the question? Maybe slow down just a sec, a bit for me. Sorry. That's okay.
I like the idea of creating. I think that's part of the focus, uh, that we focus more on building and creating than we do on dismantling. And so I don't know that I have the answer to that question, but I think as we exist in our authentic identities, that there's something to that image. Stephanie Lampkin talked about what she saw and how that encouraged her to pursue something. And then we talked about what we've seen in Pine Sol and Popeye's commercials and how that motivates a certain mindset about our capabilities and who we are. And so I think existing unapologetically in your authentic self does something that you might not yet ever realize. But you are an image in yourself and you are a representation for something. And so uh, we can't apologize for who we are and our uh, convictions, but we can unapologetically share them. And I will say, being on a college campus every day as a professional, I'm reminded of being on a college campus as a student and not realizing the effect uh, that my air of confidence had on other women who related to me who may have never said anything to me in the four years that I attended undergrad. But that representation matters, whether it's ever acknowledged or not. So exist in your authentic self, and I think that that has arms and legs that can respond to a whole lot of the other very complex issues we experience in terms of our uh, identity intersections. I hope that answers your question, because it was deep, girl. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.